Yeah, and if anyone knows a good production, too, of the Bravo, I'm not aware of one, but that would be really great to have a, a production of it, because it's well, a pretty long book. Vin Vince, Vince is a, a script writer. Oh, is with he? A, with, who's always hungry for, uh, for some good resources of history. So I think, Vince, the, uh, the challenge is on you, I think, to put together a script. God, I, I, I don't know. That might take a deeper dive than I, I had thought of, but that is a possibility. You know, there's there's a lot of material that you guys stir up when you do these things, I must say. I got a sense that the, uh, the part of the the excerpt you, you selected from Schiller on uh, theater as a moral institution also had the, the germ seed of the idea that was expressed in his Ode to Joy poem that Beethoven used for his Ninth Symphony. Was that uh, also something that, uh, Sorry. am I right on that? Sorry, what did you say? That Schiller's, the thought that Schiller develops in the essay on theater as moral institution, that it's the same thought that he develops more thoroughly in the poem on the Ode to Joy. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Um, yeah, and interesting too, like Beethoven also was alive. I mean, Schiller and Beethoven were alive when Napoleon was like, you know, coming to power and, and there was a lot of like hopes for Napoleon um, <clears throat> being a, a proper leader to, to France. So Beethoven as well um, was very much a supporter of uh, the, the Republican ideals. Um, so again, like this is the sort of stuff that isn't talked about today that these artists were very much you know um thought of themselves as responsible for the uplifting and the betterment of uh their their citizenry but also just universally um and that a large part of that was this natural uh striving towards a republic and we saw actually a lot of this come back after world war ii a lot of um the colonial countries really thought that if fascism was defeated, as we were told in World War II, thus colonialism should also have been defeated. If you fought in the war against fascism, it also meant, it should have meant automatically that you were freed as a colonial power. And, uh, you know, we saw Vietnam wanted to set itself up as a republic and uh, the Vietnam War was very much started over French colonial interests. So, I mean, it's still it's still uh, uh, something that we're battling to to this day in terms of the right to form a republic against this idea of the divine right of a few or a king. Um, and it also is once we do have a republic, the question of how do you uphold uh, the principles, the true principles of a republic, which uh, you know, again, I think that a system of meritocracy is really, it has to be a fundamental part of that um, for it to be uh, upheld. And you have to have a system where you uphold a quality of education. And these are at the core of um, the starting points of where, where we should be. Yeah, and your, your idea of how, um... Oh, Jerry has a question. Okay, well, I'll just get a thought out then, Jerry. I'll, I'll ask you to ask your question. Um, but how, how in education, the, the art of storytelling has to be at the, at the bedrock uh, of developing the moral character of the individuals, the students going through the educational process. Um, so it's not just appealing to the intellect or the behavior, but rather the soul uh, and the identity in a, in a meaningful way. That's really key. And mm -hmm. I think what you did by getting at the... Um, the crux of world history located in the in the Declaration and the Constitution together as two documents that seem to express opposing views, right, of, of ourselves as being as the good located in the, the welfare of the whole versus the good located in the sacredness of individual rights. The, many people would think those are incompatible 
you know, extremes that you have to pick one or the other. Yeah, sacrifice um, one for the other. Yeah, uh, but the question of free will and the mature human being who recognizes that it's by doing their duty to a greater whole beyond themselves that they find their freedom and that the freedoms and their consent uh, or the, con the consent of the governed that generate the legitimacy of the laws of the nation are derived from those sorts of, of matured minds, right? Citizen, real citizens and not just subjects who want to be doted upon by a bureaucracy. That's really the key and, and great artists are always finding ways of uh, showcasing the failures of the, of the masses and the failures of the leadership, but, you know, but, but not saying one, never really demonstrating that it's just one or just the other, the way Cooper did in that. And you did a really great job summarizing the, uh, the, those lessons uh, very nicely. Well, <clears throat> what you said just made me think about uh, Lafayette. Um, you know, P Pierre Baudry did that very good article, which I can't remember it. But again, I'll bring these things up. And if anyone's interested, you can just, uh, you know, email me. Um, but this the, the the false dichotomy because that's where you know that tragedy is going to be unavoidable in your course for the future if you if you have a a, a false paradox or you have a, a false dichotomy so not a false paradox but it's a false dichotomy so lafayette was torn between the hereditary principle the romanticism of the aristocracy and also this idea of a romantic idea of a, a, a democracy that would you know kind of have you know be ruled by a sense of popular opinion which as cooper says you have to be very careful with that popular opinion plays a role but you have to you have to keep it in check as well, because it can turn into a mob. Um, or you can just pay service to it, as we see in our, our societies, and it just doesn't go anywhere, right? It's all, all facade. But he had this false um, two extremes, which he couldn't resolve. And that's very much like the Cold War that we live in today as well. Was this like the false extremes of the two sides that were both acting like they had the answer, which was a, a very extreme viewpoint of like collectivism under Marxism uh, and Bolshevism. And then you had uh, this like the false li individual liberty of, uh, you know, the, the, the liberals, you know, very much a, a libertarian free market um, type um, ideology and that the solution didn't lie in either of those extremes. And if anyone were going to be caught picking sides in that, you were going to like, you know, um, condemn yourself to being ruled one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, very good. Jerry, did you have a, a question? Unmute. Okay, yes. Um, oh, Cynthia, you give me <laughs> so much to think about with this class. I'll be thinking about it for a while. But I really liked at the end where you brought in Schiller, the part I got to read, because, you know, you look at this book, The Bravo, and it's just a horrible ending. It's such a tragedy. There's no justice. But the part with Schiller, you think that, well, the tragedy is the effect it's going to have on the reader, the, the person who reads the book, so that they see this injustice and it'll actually change them. So they recognize injustice in the world. I thought that was very good. But my question is that you brought up that the, the problem is not only, you know, the oligarchy that ran Venice, that's the problem, but it's also that the people tolerated it. They went along with it. That's the same as a problem. And it reminds me of this idea of the mob because with um, some of the sh short stories of Edgar Allan Poe, you read by, well, he's attacking this idea of the, the mob too, the unruly mob. And it's, it's the problem in America. And I was just wondering, there must have been, you know, some connection between Cooper and Poe because you kind of see a similarity in this, this idea of the mob, the people that just go along with this evil and don't say anything. Mm -hmm. I don't know 
if if you know about that or yeah well i mean i'm sure you're you're uh aware of of it uh that um jeff steinberg had uh done work where he uh apparently was able to confirm that edgar poe's grandfather was a part of the society of uh, cincinnati was a member for some reason there isn't a record of poe being a part of this but there are letters by alexandre dumas who was living in france Cooper was living in France and his house was very much a, a political salon for republicanism when he was there. And Poe was also in France. They were all there at the same time. And Alexandre Dumas was uh, writing about how uh, Poe was, was, was coming to his house. And, and I think Cooper is uh, somehow attached to this as well. So there isn't, there isn't like a direct proof, but there's a lot of likelihood um, that, you know, Poe is engaged in the cultural warf warfare like um, Cooper, except Cooper, you know, was given one of those intelligence roles where you, you can be in the public, you know, you can very much be in the public eye, whereas some of the intelligence roles are not so great, like in The Spy, where you have to be so secretive that, you know, no one is going to likely know what you ever have done um, for uh, the true liberty of people. And Poe might have possibly taken more of that kind of um, role, which is a lot harder and a lot less romantic. Um, and again, there's a lot of um, a lot to show that Edgar Poe was likely assassinated. Um, he was going to start this this magazine and he was going to actually become a lot more public, it seems, and politically organizing at that point. Um, so it looked like he was transitioning with the type of um, political intelligence he was going to do. And he was he was murdered, you know, on his train ride along the way to, I think, deposit um, a huge sum of money to get this project launched. And, um, you know, he was he's poisoned. He had that weird stay in the hospital and, and, and then like died shortly after that. So and then Griswold took a hold of all of his stuff. And that's why we think of Poe as nothing but an alcoholic nowadays, because the official biographer or, you know, holder of all of the uh, writings of Poe actually hated Poe. And that's often the case with these things. They try to uh, wipe the memory of these people one way or another. Satomi, you've been waiting. Oh, well, that was so excellent, uh, Cynthia. Gosh, you know, it's so such a shame we don't know about Cooper, more about Cooper, even movies or anything. But um, I just want to comment that uh, D.L. Moody said that, you see, study, but also he, in his uh, uh, school, he emphasized development of character. It has to be balanced. And, um, and you know, it's very chilling how this whole Venice thing it reminds me of so much of the biblical structure, like the, you know, the uh, prophet, priest, and king, and then the fivefold ministry. Like it, it's, um, and yet it's perverted for something so evil. They, um, they always take the best of what is of the Bible and they pervert it, you know, for their own. And, and it's, it's just uh, chilling when I see that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They, they, well, Venice, actually, um, if you want to know a little bit more about Venice's role in infiltrating uh, the, uh, the Vatican, um, I have a paper called uh, A Study of Schiller's Ghost Seer, because Schiller also wrote uh, something on Venice called Ghost Seer. And um, in that paper, I go through how uh, Venice actually uh, had a lot of cardinals at that point. They were really infiltrating the church and they were very much behind the, um, I forgot the Latin phrase of like, uh, but it was like the library of forbidden books. And so they had banned certain writers like Erasmus and Machiavelli and so forth and, uh, and Plato. And uh, they were promoting Aristotle like it very upfront, a uh, very public manner. So um, what's interesting is that it seems that what Cooper is writing during the period that Cooper is writing about um, in, in Venice during the Bravo is when they were going through the Venetian indict, which you can look up on Wikipedia. I didn't actually, Matt and myself both, we did, weren't aware of this, that this was the sixth time that Venice kind of got itself in trouble with the, the church. 
And uh, there was almost a war that broke out, but Henry IV, uh, you know, diplomatically resolved it. But part of the um, the criticism of the church against Venice was the works of Paolo Sarpi, which again, you can read about it in my, my paper um, of Schiller's Ghost Seer, but Paolo Sarpi was very much in the middle of um, corrupting the educational system but also in, in, in the teachings of the church as well. And so it was a very um, destructive philosophy that actually uh, very much um, influenced the enlightenment movement um, and uh, caused a lot of problems that we still have in academia today where we, we kind of deny now a top-down approach or even metaphysics in discussion were very much based on, um, you know, empir empiricism. And uh, I will believe it if I see it with my own eyes, you know, sort of thing. And so it's really c corrupted academia in general. And, and Paulo Sarpi is very much the one who started that. So very interesting that the church seems to have recognized that and, and had this uh, indict against Venice. I did remember reading some of that uh, uh, Schiller's uh, okay, I think you read it. paper, and I'll have to reread it again. But because it's you know, as you say, you can uh, see the parallels in many of what you just talked about today. Yeah, yeah, it's sad that like I mean, Florence also very much Florence, the city of the Renaissance, very much recognized that Venice was the enemy of these types of values. Um, and, uh, you know, the identity of mankind as being something uh, sacred and noble. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a fight that has continued throughout the ages, as Matt has mentioned in, a, in an interview he did of the secrets known only to the inner elite, this Plato versus Aristotle, you know, mindset of what defines um, humanity has been there for, uh, you know, a very, very long time. And we're still, we're still battling it out today. Um, as you can see with the unipolar versus the multipolar outlook, um, which, you know, I'm hopeful that, that it can succeed and we'll get over a little bit of a bump, but for the long haul, we still have to solve this problem of education and how best to ennoble the individuals of a society. Yeah, I, I put uh, Cynthia's, the, the first of Cynthia's two essays on Schiller's Gosier and Venice um, in the chat box so people can link, uh, click on that link. Um, there's also, I mean, a lot of leads that are opened up, one of which being that Galileo, who in many ways is the father, the recognized father of the Enlightenment, which we're told was the organic evolution of the Renaissance period into the Enlightenment. No, there was an artificial intervention to pervert the Renaissance and try to destroy it from within, which we then called the Enlightenment. Galileo was receiving uh, his stipend until his last days from the personal secretary of Paolo Sarpi. Mm. So that's just one of many points of evidence to demonstrate the artificial character of that entire period that derailed the flow of human creative evolution um, and still wields and holds the minds of many scientists and philosophers in a vice even now. Um, John Barr wrote Against Oligarchy by Tarpley. Yeah, that's another work. Um, you mentioned uh, Secrets Not Only to the Inner Elites. That was actually the title of, a, of an essay by Lyndon LaRouche that I'd, I'd been citing in, in recent uh, interviews, and that's also a really good thing. I'll, we'll put some of these in, in the description box of this video. Uh, we have time for one last question. I saw the, the name of Robin uh, who popped in there. So Robin, do you have still your question in mind? Are you, are you there, Robin? Okay, well, what I, what I saw, Robin, he actually wrote down his question, I believe. Uh, oh, he says, he, I, I don't have a mic. Oh, that, that's difficult. Okay, well, Robin wrote down the gist of his question. I'm just scrolling up to find it now. Um, here we go. How does the tree of... The piece of Paris fold into these founding documents of the American Republic. Is that is that something you'd like to address at all? Or? I think you're more equipped to answer that question. Um, I don't have a strong answer on that. I, I just know that the 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 the, the, 
the Peace of Paris was something signed in 1783. That was six years after the, the Declaration of Independence. So in that sense, on the Declaration, they had zero uh, impact on that. Um, the Peace of Paris, where the British sort of gave a uh, nominal liberty to the colonists uh, for their, their independence and ending, that ended the war revolution. They only gave it sort of in in words. The British oligarchy, as as I think everyone here knows, never actually gave real uh, power of independence, or or never forgave the rebellious colony for for declaring independence. And there are always there are troops hmm? made in the United States for for years after the treaty was signed. As well, the what did the British troops? There were British mm. troops that remained in the United States years after the treaty was signed. That's one of the reasons why the Society of Cincinnati was formed was because, you know, it was good that everybody returned to, you know, a life other than military, but you needed to have a center that was able to organize very quickly in case there would be a second attempt by the British whose troops were in the United States still. So, and then you all, always had the Canada problem too. Mm. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and I think one, one thing you could say on what you just pointed out, that's such an important idea. People often underestimate the fact that the British are still there. Uh, I forget about that too. Um, is that the, the Articles of Confederation before the Constitution was, was drafted in 1787, largely as the, the, uh, a project run by the, the, the Society of Cincinnati and Ben Franklin, um, Without that, that those two aspects, there would not have been a constitution. But ten years, there was no real constitution, right? It was the Articles of Confederation, which was a very weak uh, set of of legal documents that gave each state the right to do whatever they wanted. There was no unifying nation. Every part of the states uh, were in, were bankrupt in total unpayable debt. No industry, no means of paying off anything or standing on their own two feet. So there was, it was obvious. Everyone kind of knew that unless something qualitatively changed, there would be a complete takeover once more by the British and the American Revolution would be undone. It was just a question of when. So uh, in that sense, the, the, the preamble of the Constitution that Cynthia read at the beginning of, of the principle of, of we the people in order to form a more perfect union and, and provide for the general defense and... and um, all of those other beautiful concepts was done in order to solve the problem, to, to create a, a, a unified nation, which politically and economically had a means of wielding power for, by a sovereign nation in opposition to this oligarchical interest that had already taken over Britain from Venice for a century already, right? Venice had been totally taken over by their own Venetian deep state a hundred years before that in 1688. So um, I think those people who organized that, including Cooper's father and Ben Franklin, um, recognized the importance of getting that type of nation and power in place. So that that's, yeah, I think your question, Robin, was actually pretty good. <laughs> the, more, the more we were just talking about it. <laughs> yeah, it was very, the Treaty of Paris was very connected to those two documents in, in, in ways I didn't even realize. Cynthia, do you have anything else you'd like to uh, end on or any final parting thoughts? No. <laughs> well, this was great. Um, we're gonna have this uh, made into, the, into a video like usual uh, for public consumption and rewatching very shortly with a lot of associated recommended reading and viewing for supplementary work that people wanna do following up on this. Um, I'm, I think that we should also include the link to Cooper's, uh, a couple of Cooper's writings on archive.org. I think we can do that. Um, so people could read some Cooper on their own. And for anybody with a creative bent, uh, either here live or watching on YouTube, um, if you want to think more seriously about writing some scripts, uh, <laughs> take Cooper's life and work in the geopolitical light world into inspiration, then now is an opportunity to do that. So I think this is just waiting for, it's waiting for it. It's got to happen. For sure. <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming. And thank you, Cynthia, so much for sharing this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good job. Thank you.